All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. Today is a special day, Father. It's the day that is set aside amongst the entire church calendar where we celebrate your beloved Son coming to earth in order to save us from our sins. Father, I pray that this message would move past the head to the heart and from our heart to our lives and conversations. In the blessed name of Jesus, amen. I'd like us all to open up our Bibles this morning to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. You were probably expecting the Christmas story from Luke. We did that last night because Jesus was born at night, obviously. So we're moving to Galatians chapter 4. Well, we're still going to talk about, obviously, the birth of Christ. Galatians 4, beginning of verse 1. Say amen if you're there. Actually, you know, I'm not even going to ask because I still hear flipping. So I still hear flipping. Galatians 4, 1. 12, it's up there, man. Yeah. <laughs> Galatians 4. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different than a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born in a law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son than an heir through God. Amen. <laughs> Ilea is the cutest little thing I've ever heard. I'm just telling you right now, she's got commentary over everything. She has got commentary over everything. Uh. <laughs> so in my household, in my household, uh, I don't know how it goes in your household, but in my household, we put up the Christmas decorations. Some people are purists. So, and the church calendar, today's Christmas. So some people are real purists. They put up all their stuff uh, last night, all right? I am not that guy. I like to see all the stuff throughout. As far as I'm concerned, Christmas starts as soon as the Thanksgiving Day turkey is digested. Uh, and so the next day is when Christmas season begins. So we put up the stockings. We put up the lights. We, put up, we go out. We get that tree. My tree at home is so dead, it's ridiculous because we got it right away. And, and, and that thing is dead as a doornail. But nevertheless, and uh, now I'm not going to ruin anything. So let's just say that some gifts are under the tree from relatives and things like that. Uh, uh, and, and maybe from mom and dad before uh, Christmas morning. The reason I love that is because I love to torture my children. <laughs> I really do. I, I love to sit, and they, they, they walk by it every day before dinner. After dinner, you can see their little faces. They're looking. They're looking at all these little boxes. And, and uh, my wife is more of a stickler than I am. I let them mess with the boxes, too, you know, uh, so they can pick this up, and they can say, you know, they, they make all these guesses. What is this, Daddy? And I always tell them it's one snowshoe. That's what you get. That's one snowshoe, just one. Uh, and, and we make jokes, and, and all right. And I enjoy it as a dad, but uh, I know that nothing gets to happen until Christmas morning. What makes this an even more special morning <laughs> is that Christmas happened on a Sunday. There are other churches that don't have services today. Oh, we were having service today. We were having service today. I mean, yeah, we love Jesus. Amen. But it was also fantastic to see my kids come downstairs. Look at them gifts and go, get into the car, kids. Let's go. Let's get into the car. We got to go to church. Bah! Bah! You, uh, you thought it. Uh, anyway. And <laughs> the waiting. We hate waiting, don't we? I am an American, and not just an American, a 2022 American. Do you remember 
If you're my age or older, do you remember how much we had to wait? We used to have to go to this place called a library and actually get books and look up information in those books. Someone would ask a question of us, and we wouldn't know the answer. And, and there, was, there was no Google. There was no looking anything up. We, we had to go to this weird location and pull out a little drawer and go through the decimals. Do you remember the decimals? Do you remember those? The sadistic satanic decimal system. And you would look at the thing, and then you would go find that book, and you get that book, and then that book doesn't have the answer. So you got to put that book back, and you got to go back, and you got to do the Satan decimal system. Now we don't need that. Now we just pull out uh, our phones. I don't know why we call those phones. They barely make phone calls. But what they do have is everything else on earth on them, don't they? So now someone has a question, we just pick up our phone, we just type in a code, and we go, oh, we're going to look it up. Oh, there it is, right there. All right, I, I am not knocking technology. It's technology that allows us to broadcast the gospel uh, to people not even in our area. Amen? Uh, I am not against technology at all. What I'm saying, though, is that technology has made it so we don't have to wait. I don't know about you, but I've become so impatient in life that I refuse to watch a program. I, I literally do. I won't watch it if I have to watch a commercial. I will say, no, we ain't watching this right now. No, we're going to hit record, and we're going to wait 30 minutes. That's what we're going to do. And then I'll watch it from the beginning 30 minutes later so I can fast forward through all the commercials. I, ain't, I refuse. So then people will say to me, did you see that commercial? No. No, I didn't. I haven't seen a commercial in five years, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I refuse to watch commercials. Why? Because I'm impatient. Because I hate waiting. And technology has given me the opportunity. I, don't, I never watch football games on time. They put commercials in football games after like every play. So I just record the football game and then fast forward. I watch an entire football game in 45 minutes. Uh, and, and it's fantastic. Okay. But all this technology, all this stuff, all the things that we have in our life make it so that we hate waiting, don't we? We absolutely hate waiting. But did you know that sometimes... Well, I shouldn't say sometimes. All the time when it comes to God, we can't hurry him up. I can't pause him and say, I'll get back to you, God, in 30 minutes when you're ready to deliver and then hit play. The birth of Jesus was a long-anticipated thing. People lived, people prophesied, people died without seeing it because it happened in perfect timing. And so this morning, Christmas morning, I want to talk about why it's important to wait for God's perfect timing. Because he gave us his son at the perfect time. Let's talk about how the Bible tells us that we have to wait. Psalm 27, 14. Psalm 27 is my favorite psalm. It really is. Uh, and Psalm 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Do not take matters into your own hands. Do not strike first. Live at peace, even with your enemies. We can wait for God to be God. It says, take courage. Be confident. This is our God. He sits enthroned above the cherubim. Wait for God. Isaiah 40, 31. But they who wait for the Lord, the impetuous don't get this, they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They're going to run. They're not going to grow weary because what did they do? They waited. Psalm 46.10, be still. You know what that is? That's waiting. Just be still. You know how much better our life would be if we just shut up for five minutes and be still? Before we spoke, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. You're going to go back to work, maybe not Monday, I don't know, after the new year, whatever. And you're going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait in that. Whew. 
How many of us remember this when we're there? Do we remember this when we're there? No. I don't know about you, but it's much easier for me to drive two hours moving than two hours sitting and getting to a location. All that tells us is how much we hate waiting. But do you want to know, even worse than this, the kind of waiting is right there. No, no, before we get serious, I'm not getting serious. This is what happens. These doctors are sadistic because this is what their little offices do. They put you in the waiting room, right? That's all this guy's doing. And then what they do is they call you. And they know what they're doing. Sometimes you get called sooner. You're like, ooh, I'm going to get seen on time. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Then they put you in that room, and that's where you die. <laughs> that's where you die. They knew what they were doing the whole time. And I hear medical people say, well, you just don't understand. No, you don't understand. If I make an appointment at 4, I see you at 4. That's all I'm saying. Anyway, nevertheless, they call you, they put you in that little room, and you wait, and you die. That's what it feels like to sit in that little room. That's a picture of me last time I went to the doctor, right there. That's what happened. It's unbelievable. But then we do have serious waiting. Now that's a picture. We do have a lot of serious waiting. There's the guy that gets the bad news. And he's waiting. He took a scan. What other serious waiting? Waiting for God to give us kids. I can look out in this room and I can see that there are individuals that do not have children that are earnestly praying, believing, and waiting. Some people are praying and believing for a husband or a wife. They're lonely. They want their match. That's a different kind of waiting, isn't it? That's a painful waiting. Waiting to get news. Waiting to see what's going to happen. You know, other serious waiting that we don't talk about, I have the privilege, and that is the right word, I have the privilege of ministering to people in their uh, various stages of dying, especially when they're older. They're not afraid of dying. Do you know what they're really upset about? They're upset about living. And they ask all the time, why, why won't God, what, take me home? I hear it all the time. It's a different kind of waiting. They want to go to heaven, but God, in his perfect timing, has not yet brought them there. It's a different kind of pain and a different kind of waiting. What I hope happens this morning is that we can remain at peace, trusting God in our waiting. Because... You're welcome, sweetie. Uh, that peace in God in our waiting. Angels, you know the story. We read it last night. You know the story. It's the night when Jesus was born. Angels appear in the heavens. They speak to the shepherd. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. He will be wrapped in clothes, in swaddling clothes, and lying in a manger. And the shepherds go, and they see the child. Now, what's so amazing about this, and we don't spend time thinking about it. The shepherds go, they see the child, they saw the angels, and then what happens circumstantially worldwide? What happens? Nothing. Nothing changes right then, circumstantially, with any of those people. We actually don't hear about Jesus for another 12 years. We don't hear a thing. He gets circumcised. And we hear nothing. Everything just goes on. Like, I thought something fantastic was going to happen. And at 12, it's not like it's a significant thing. His parents just forget about him in Jerusalem. Not in the, I, mean, I mean, they do. They just forget about Jesus. And they start going home, you know. And the next, it actually says the next morning, they're like, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? Oh, he's in Jerusalem. And then they get, and what's cute about that story is they get mad at Jesus. He's 12. He should have been like, you, you left me. What? 
Uh, but they, they find him in the temple uh, at 12. All right, so that account takes place. But nothing significant happens. Another 18 years pass before Jesus is revealed in his baptism to be the Lamb of God and his public ministry begins. That's when things begin to change circumstantially. Where, are, where do you think some of the shepherds are that saw the baby Jesus? Where do you think some of them? I'm not saying all of them, some of them. They're dead. Some of them are dead. So they saw baby Jesus. They said, wow, the world is going to change. And then nothing happened. And they died. This is a lesson. You know what else is a lesson? And we don't, we don't spend hardly enough time on this reality. Jesus is God in the flesh. Amen? Amen. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen. All right. So did Jesus have the power to heal from conception, yes or no? Okay, great. That's fantastic. At the cross, Jesus is dying, and one of the seven things he says to the cross, he looks at John the apostle, and he says, Behold your mother. And he looks at Mary, Behold your son. That would have been a terrible rudeness if someone was still alive. Who? His stepfather, Joseph. Every scholar believes, and I completely agree with them, that by the time Jesus began his public ministry, Joseph's dead. So now I want you to, to live that story. Your God in the flesh. We know that Joseph was around at 12 because he went to the temple. So dude who raised you, dude who took care of mom who birthed you, dude who fed you every night, get sick. He's in his bed, and he's dying. You're Jesus. You know what you can do? You, like, you could be like a, a, a Jedi about it, man. You could be in the other room and just go, ho, oh. ho. And Joseph would have been well, got off his sickbed, and stepdaddy would have been just fine. And no one ever would have had to know. So I want you to live the story. Your father, your stepfather, is dying in front of you. He's coughing. He's feverish. Your mom is crying. Your other brothers and sig uh, sisters, your siblings, because the Bible's clear about that, that he had siblings, are sitting there weeping. They're all looking at Joseph. They're holding his hands. They're praying to God. And God is in that room looking at the pain. And he does what? He does nothing. And Joseph dies. Jesus goes to the funeral. He mourns with the family. Why? Because it wasn't his time. It wasn't his time. It was the timing was not perfectly timed. That should prove something to us. <laughs> if Jesus... Let his own stepdad die because it wasn't time. I think that should speak to us. <clears throat> Silence, waiting. To me, it's an amazing point about the perfect time of God. Why do you think Jesus didn't exercise? Because it wasn't his time for public ministry. My point is very simple. We cannot hurry up the plan of God. We can't. We cannot hurry up the plan of God. So we might as well get used to knowing two things about God. A, or number one, he's good. B, he will work everything together in his perfect timing. Galatians 4. But when the fullness of time had come, meaning when everything had culminated to just the right what? Time. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those, to rescue those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. You know, no one talks about it. The Romans at the time were terribly oppressive, okay? They ruled at the time the known world. Nobody under their oppression liked the oppression, but do you want to know what advantage it gave the apostles? They could travel the known world freely because it was all owned by Rome. Perfect time. 
The trade language at that time under the Romans was Greek. Everyone was forced to know the trade language. So the gospel could be spread to the known world because everybody was forced to know it. Perfect timing. Just to prove to you that even oppressive, tyrannical government can be used by God to spread his word in his perfect timing. All of history is in God's hand. You know that? Everything. He knows the best season for sending help to his church, a new light to the world. Let us not be anxious about any course of events that we see in the news. Let us not be anxious about the course of events in our own lives. Let us not be anxious. Be still, wait, and know that God is good. How do I know that God is good? The cross and the empty tomb. The nativity, the cross, the empty tomb, prove it to me. God was, became a man. He became a blastocyst, a fetus, a baby, and a man. He lived the life we could not live. He cast out demons. He raised the dead. He walked on water. He fed the 5,000. And then he stretched out his hands and he took my punishment upon himself. And then he rose again, defeating the very thing that everyone is afraid of, death itself. So that if we'd simply believe in him, we will move from death to life. So, beloved, be anxious over what? Nothing. Your God is good. He is working everything for good. And everything is going according to plan. Everything is going according to his plan. And Christmas proves it. Christmas proves it. One last thing. Our want for things now does not move God to give us things now. It's just that simple. We have been lulled into a place where we do not have to wait. God will not be pushed. So he is going to do everything according to his perfect plan. And that's something that you and I can rest in. We can find peace in. We can be still and know that he is God. Amen. Amen. God is good all the time. time. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. Thank you for your perfect timing. Thank you for your perfect son. Thank you for his life, his death, his resurrection. We give you the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. The plates are in the